we have with us today Rahul Pandita, whose uh, very interesting book, I must say, uh, Our Moon Has Blood uh, Clots, is out. The reviews have been exceptionally good. Um, he touches upon a subject which is uh, perhaps forgotten for many of us, the exodus of Kashmiri Pandits. The reason, according to me at least, why Rahu's book is interesting is not because it speaks about Kashmir or Kashmiri Pandits, but because it humanizes the entire story. So uh, thank you Rahul for joining us. Uh, Rahul, let me begin by asking you, uh, what made you, I mean, I am sure this whole thing was behind in your mind because you've grown up with it and um, it, it must have left a deep imprint and there is of course your brother uh, to whom you have dedicated the book. But tell us what led you to write this particular uh, book. I think I, you know, um, I say to my friends and I joke about it sometimes that, uh, uh, you know, I've already written a couple of books and maybe in the next 30 years if I'm alive, I might write uh, another 5-10 books or whatever. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, this is the most important book I'll ever write. And uh, this is uh, one of the main reasons I chose to become a journalist, a writer in some sense. Uh, so this book has always... Uh, been inside me, you know, it's my story, the story of my family um, and of hundreds of thousands of Kashmiri Pandits uh, who were forced to uh, leave Kashmir in 1989 90. And I'm just so overwhelmed by the commonality of uh, response where people from all over India, um, you know, and even abroad, uh, you know, the Kashmiri diaspora, uh, they're calling me uh, and telling me that, you know, they've gone through exactly. Uh, similar hardships, difficulties, uh, frightening experiences uh, in 1990. Yeah. Um, so this book has been an extremely important book for me to write um, and I'm glad I've done it after struggling with it for many, many years. But tell me something, I mean, your uh, the subtitle to the book says The Exodus of Kashmiri Pandits and many of the reviews speak about the untold story. I mean, one of the things, in fact, just before this interview where joking about another book which is going to be called Kashmir, the Untold Story. Uh, ha is the story of Kashmiri Pandits untold? I think, um, you know, in a conflict like conflict zone like Kashmir, it's always good uh, that more and more stories are coming out. Um, I think personally I'm of the belief that uh, more and more narratives should come out uh, from Kashmiris um, because we've had, we have suffered pain for more than two decades. Um, in this bloody uh, conflict. Um, but specifically talking about Kashmiri Pandits, I think yes. Uh, the Kashmiri Pandit story unfortunately has been relegated to margins. I think in the last few years, what has really made me angry is the fact that it has even been kicked off uh, those margins because somehow it's not fashionable to talk about uh, the plight of uh, uh, That's That's one Kashmiri of the things, Pandits. yeah, that's one of the things I really want to ask you and I, I have a few Kashmiri Pandits friends, you are one of them, and especially on Twitter and other places. People like even uh, Pavan Durani and others, they always keep saying that how mainstream media somehow seems to be more concerned about the Kashmiris in the valley than the Kashmiris who have been thrown out. I'm not trying to make the differentiation based on religion, sure. but I think everybody is a Kashmiri at the end of the day. So why do you think is the reason that mainstream media as well as the mainstream politicians uh, you know, do not speak about the plight or even the Kashmiris in Kashmir Valley do not speak about the plight of Kashmiri Pandits? I think, uh, y you know, the answer is uh, multifold. Uh, um, you know, as far as the Indian media is concerned, um, it's a black and white situation for them. Uh, that here are these, this com one set of people who have been brutalized at the hands of the Indian state. What they conveniently forget or even ignore at times is that the same set of people have also victimized another set of people who happen to be Kashmiri Pandits in this case. So somehow when you talk about the Indian brutality, uh, you know, the brutality of the Indian state in Kashmir or Northeast, um, I call them the Fab India narratives mm. uh, roughly. So, you know, you are in a particular position where you are very fashionable, etc. When I wrote, wrote my previous book, Hello Bastard, you know, so many people from that ghetto, 
added me on the Facebook because they thought I was one of their own, mm. uh, you know, who's fashionably subversive, mm. uh, who, you know, whose habit is to ridicule the Indian state and talk about it, which are valid questions, you know, uh, if something wrong is happening in Chhattisgarh, and I, as a journalist, I think it's very important for me to uh, chronicle those stories also. But now the same set of people are looking at me and they're thinking of me as a class enemy <laughs> in many ways because I've come up with this story which does not fit uh, in their, you know, in their scheme of things. So I think uh, I'm very happy um, that I've come up with this book and I'm really overwhelmed at the kind of response I'm getting from all over. But there are people who will live in a uh, permanent uh, state of denial. Uh, I do not even wish to engage with them. I would rather engage with the uh, s someone you know who's willing to on a scale of one to ten willing to exceed five points and I'm willing to exceed five points to him but someone who is hell-bent on maintaining his position at one or ten mm. I don't w I do not wish to engage no, what is also fascinating about and uh, to be very honest I think a lot of us when we first hear about Kashmir Pandi stories we presume that is going to be again as it's in the scale of one to ten is going to be either one of the extremes but what is fascinating about your book at least the past that I have read it seems that you are conceding that there has been brutality on the Kashmiri Muslims. You speak about the entire history of Kashmir, where we actually, they, Kashmir actually saw various kind of rulers, both Hindus and Muslims, who have actually dealt with the masses very extremely in a very violent manner over the years. And you do bring in the Dogra rulers and you do speak about how Dogra rulers had been bad to the Muslim population, whereas the Pandits lived in relative peace. But prior to that, you do also mention Muslim rulers who had been bad to the Kashmiri Pandits. Absolutely. And then, of course, and then you speak about... So, so in many sense, your narration doesn't actually fit into any of these prescribed, uh, you know, boxes. Absolutely. I'm also mentioning, uh, you know, if you further read the book, I'm also mentioning this uh, episode uh, right after the exodus. Um, where uh, I meet some of uh, the RSS, you know, I'm in the middle yes. of a RSS Shaka yes. and uh, they try to channel my anger mm. towards Kashmiri Muslims. Mm. Um, and thank God, you know, I was very young and, I, you know, I was quite angry about what had happened to us. But it was my father, um, you know, his dignified response uh, to what they had told me. And, you know, he was very persistent uh, that I should not get into these things, that I should pursue my education. Um, and I'm glad he was there to... Uh, uh, sort of advise me and uh, take me on this course correction. Otherwise, you know, the trajectory I would have taken uh, might have been different. Who knows? Um, so, uh, you know, this book, um, I forgot, what was the other, other thing we were I, talking I, about? I, I really wanted to... Yeah, yeah so yeah, yeah. So in, you know, I've been going to Kashmir as a journalist for the last 15 years. Mm. And I've been in exile for 23 years. I think in the last 15 years, I've covered every aspect of Kashmir, you know, the other Kashmir. I've reported about forced disappearances, I've reported about this phenomena of half widows, I've reported human rights violation, I've reported state brutality, um, uh, 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 you know, every aspect. I think I've, I must have done dozens of uh, stories on the plight of uh, Kashmiri uh, Muslims. I've reported on these fathers who have been made to frog jump in front of uh, their own sons. I think in my whole career, in these 15 years, of my reporting from Kashmir, I may have done four or five stories on Kashmiri Pandits. So no one can really accuse me yes. of turning a blind eye. And even on behalf of my own community, you know, the problem is this extreme state of denial, which I was talking to you about. Uh, maybe members of my community do not raise their voice or they do not talk about certain bad things which have happened to the Kashmiri majority community, mm. uh, like the Gaukadal massacre or the Kunan Poshpura uh, rape case, which may have happened in 1991. They might not talk about it, but the fact is that nothing is being denied mm. uh, to Kashmiri Muslims as far as these narratives are concerned. We don't go to them and say, look, oh, you are lying. Gaukadal massacre never happened. These 21 people or 51 people, depending on whether you believe the official figure or unofficial figure, it never happened. Or the rapes at Kunan Poshpura never happened. But in turn, uh, you know, they do it to us. I mean, hundreds of thousands of Kashmiri pundits forced to leave the land on one single night, you know, when hundreds of thousands of people assembled um, in the mosque all over Kashmir Valley. Uh, and shouted these anti-India uh, slogans and anti-Pandit 
uh, slogans against us. So, you know, it's an, what happened in 90 is very unfortunate. Mm. But I think the bigger betrayal, the, it's insulting to our col collective memory when you are saying that nothing happened on January 90, 1990. I find that very insulting. And I think my book is a response uh, to that uh, denial, that manipulation of truth, um, uh, if you like. Um, my book is a response, a dignified response. Uh, to their uh, this whole gamut of lies mm. they have spoken about the circumstances that led to our exodus. Let's go into your uh, personal life. I mean, I understand the whole book is about it, but uh, tell us when did your family move out? What is? I think you moved out when you were fourteen. Right? Yes, that's right. So uh, tell us and do mention your brother because there are glimpses. I think it's when he was hit by a revolver or sorry, a gun and there's images throughout the books about it. So if you could tell us a bit about that. I think we lived a very beautiful life in Kashmir. Um, there have always been problems between Kashmiri Muslims and Hindus um, because we also paid a price for upholding the national flag there. Somehow we were always seen as symbols of um, Indian Indianness in Kashmir. So but was that all the time? All the time. So all the, from forty seven to all the time. All the okay. time. Yes. Um, so you know, right from your very beginning of the childhood, you are very conscious of your identity as a Kashmiri Muslim or as a Kashmiri Hindu. Even I was, uh, because of certain things which happened very early in my life, which I uh, mention in my book. But apart from those. Um, you know, events and incidents and rare episodes. We had a beautiful life in Kashmir. My, my father and my mother both were government servants uh, and they had Muslim colleagues. I went to school and played with my uh, Muslim friends. Uh, we had a, we lived in the Srinagar suburb uh, where we're surrounded by our Muslim friends, you know, in uh, other localities, etc. Um, but I think from 86 onwards, something began to change. You know, we could feel it in the air, as I write in the uh, in my memoir also. Um, things were not going well. You know, our milkman would come uh, to our doorstep if we were renovating our house and say, "Oh, why are you wasting so much time uh, and money and resources on your house? Because if not today, then tomorrow, this house will belong to us." And we would take it as a joke because you know, it's been jolly. We would tease. Uh, each other on the in, in India Pakistan cricket matches etc which we took it in the you know took in the right stride mm. so the, you know the signals real really began um, right you know from 86 onwards my brother uh, uh, you know my right. cousin yes okay. uh, my maternal uncle's son he was mm. my immediate next door neighbor mm. um, because my mother when we were building this house in Srinagar um, uh, around the time when I was born, she insisted that uh, my father make this house next to her brother's house okay. because as a toddler she was uh, carried by her brother okay. uh, on her on his back hmm. uh, from Baramula in North Kashmir when the tribal invasion happened okay. uh, from Northwest Frontier Province from Pakistan. Um, so they were very close to each other and Ravi was very close to us. Um, and you know Ravi had some really brilliant, uh, very close Muslim friends. A uh, couple of them are mentioned, you know, Latif uh, Loon was our neighbor as well. And when I was growing and when I didn't have this consciousness of being a Kashmiri Pandit or a Kashmiri, you know, whether I was a Kashmiri Pandit or a Kashmiri Muslim, I always thought of them as two brothers. So on one hand, Rabi was my brother, but Latif was my brother also. I used to call him Bhaijan, you know, mm. uh, the way the whole family, my sisters, my cousin sisters, all of them used to call him Latif Bhaijan. So we're very close to each other. And, you know, uh, he was my first hero, Ravi, you know, when you're growing up right. and you have an elder brother who you look up to. Mm. Uh, I used to, you know, I wanted to emulate him. Uh, he would play cricket and uh, would stick posters of Krishri Kant in his cupboard and um, uh, dab Old Spice uh, after shave on his cheeks and I wanted to do that when I uh, grew up. Um, but unfortunately, um, that never happened. Um, because after migration, uh, you know, we left and everyone left and then um, in 90 itself, Latif Lone died because um, he had crossed with the border 
to receive arm train arm training um and and he died in an encounter with the uh, with the army uh and we were in exile already and uh, i remember reading about it in the newspaper and uh, nobody cooked food on that particular day uh in that small damp room of the hotel where we lived as uh, refugees and uh, a few years after that uh, bravi dragged out of the bus along with his two other hindu colleagues uh, and shot dead uh, i was here i was um, I, i had begun to work around that point of time and i came to know about it my father called me in the morning and i took this overnight bus so when i reached um, lakhanpur which is which is the border of jammu and kashmir i got hold of this uh, newspaper uh one of jammu's biggest dailies daily excel here and i saw his uh, uh i i saw his picture on the front page you carried that uh, paper yeah right? i i carried the paper it's still with me hmm. um i don't look at it i've i took it out recently after a very long time and i think uh, you know he was kind of uh, he was he was like the focus of our family you know the f- the main focal point of our family our whole life revolved around him um nothing remained the same in my family my mother took to bed she's um paralyzed now my his mother my aunt uh, she refused to take diabetes medicines hypertension medicines um my uncle my maternal uncle his father is devastated he lives in this um uh, small house in uh, jammu uh, he visits us sometimes you know he takes makes an overnight journey and sh- comes to see us here he spends an hour with us and then he would want to go back to Kash- uh, to jammu because his mind uh, is somewhere else you know he's very restless so in that sense and now you know when people come to me and say oh nothing happened to you and you know you are exaggerating this whole story for god sake look at this newspaper what happened to us come to my house and i'll show you my mother what has happened to her and talk to any kashmiri pandit who left kashmir valley in 1990 and by just telling him that you know nothing happened on january 1990 1990 or days after that you know brutalized hounded out of her homes in permanent exile uh targeted one by one brutally killed and not only uh, the way they tell you that informers were killed or people who used to work in police or intelligence agencies were killed shopkeepers doctors Some teachers mass. professors nurses unemployed people children some of them brutally gang raped girja tiku abducted in a moving car gang raped and cut alive on a mechanical saw and then you are shying away from calling it a genocide and if we call it a genocide then say oh you are using too strong a word uh, for something like this because only uh, the government says 290 people died but about 600 to 700 kashmiri pandits lost their lives also the number of uh, people who died in the initial years of exile uh, in that sweltering heat of the plains of sunstroke of exhaustion of depression of snake and scorpion bites so many of us died so as far as i'm concerned i put them together uh with the number of people uh who were hanged to death or who were shot uh dead so brutally that you know it would shame even a demon but rahul tell me you mentioned your mother and throughout the mother the book there is one quotation from her she speaks speaking uh, telling about our house uh, our home in kashmir had 22 rooms i think it became a late motive for her motive uh, to go back in, in the sense uh, to remember who she was and where she came from hmm. um, it was her and uh, she would always tell the story to anybody who's willing uh, to listen if not even willing to listen it became her personal statement kind of thing you know when this a uh, particular episode came where when we were in this dharmshala uh, where a marriage was taking place and this person comes to us uh, w- w- with a good intention of course uh, because he thought 
that sharnarthis are living mm. here so maybe uh, they don't have enough food to eat so he came with this left these leftovers from the marriage party um and before my mother could react he put that uh, plate in her hands and he went away i think that day uh, you know something changed in mother um and she began to talk about uh, this uh, this statement she kept on repeating uh this statement till 2004 when she lost her voice she can't speak now she's paralyzed um so she 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 kept on saying this my you know back in uh kashmir my house had 22 rooms my house didn't have 22 rooms but somehow this uh, you know it was much lesser i think about 12 13 rooms i guess i never counted them but uh, somehow this became it became a personal mission to tell anyone that you know we were not we are not beggars we are not sharnathis uh, we did not always live in this so one room a dwelling loss of pride in loss of pride yeah so it was her way of regaining some of what she had lost in kashmir in 1990 and it stayed with her till the end i think when i look at her even now when she can't speak i think sometimes i would like to imagine that uh, you know when a stranger comes to my house a friend comes uh, to my house who she has not met uh, before um you know i sometimes imagine that through her eyes she still conveys that message uh, that my house my home in kashmir had uh, 22 rooms and i think in the whole it's not been a conscious thing which i've done uh, whenever i'm describing any house i lived uh, after that exile in kashmir i call it a house you know i live in a delhi suburb gurgaon i have a house of my own now it's an apartment but that that feeling of home has never come really you know it's a house for me it's a it's a it's a dwelling you know uh, very well painted walls and a modular kitchen really um but as far as i'm concerned my home is the home we left in kashmir uh, 23 year, 23 years ago uh, which had tile pillars and this red um, smooth uh, cemented corridor which my mother would insist on mopping every day single day even in the harshest of winters because the idea of home um was so ingrained in her uh the idea of home is so important to every kashmiri you know um uh, that we lost that everything uh in kashmir in 1990 tell me something uh, you you do mention about how your father uh waits for you every single day uh until you arrive how late it might be now you carry your extra uh, your extra copy of the keys uh, perhaps to enter your house but he still a week waits for you to go to sleep and then perhaps uh, he goes to sleep and then of course you mention about how he stopped you from getting in, in uh, getting to get in, in getting into the whole politics bit of it with rss and others for your father and for you has the meaning of kashmiri that as lot of people sort of speak about this word changed and what do you what does kashmiri stand for you I think uh, you know I I never called it Kashmiri you know it's a it's a much abused word because those of us who stayed in Kashmir uh, knew that this was never true in a real sense um like I said you know it was a beautiful life we led and uh, my grandfather used to say that Kashmir is so beautiful that even uh, gods are jealous of it mm-hmm. so on a on a on a on a individual basis we had such a good relationship with our neighbors they would come to our house would go to their house on festivals etc um we trusted them um but on a but on a collective basis you know as a community there's always been this uh, bitterness i think like i say in my book also what it was more like is this concept of lihaz which is consideration you know which was very um strong uh, uh in a, in in a, in a place like kashmir i think we have we have we we lost that Uh, when the guns came uh, in 88 89 but 90. it seems it almost seems your father still has that uh, when he I sort think, of yeah i think i think my father had realized very early in um, when we were in exile uh, coming from his uh, story of um, you know what he had uh, heard about uh, what he had witnessed in 1947 he was very young uh, when the tribal invasion happened even he had he came from a village in central kashmir even they had to uh, run away hmm. for for few weeks when the tribal invasion happened so i think the concept of education as a community has been very important to us because somehow you know uh, because of the uh, you know years of 
centuries in fact of religious persecution um, we had come to the belief that only education can save us that's how we were saved during the Mughal rule or during um, the Afghan rule when some of us got uh, employment opportunities um, in, you know in the in, in the courts etc uh, that's how so many families uh, shifted to places like Lahore or Delhi or mm. elsewhere, Lucknow, Allahabad, that's how they settled there. So I think the, the pursuit of education, the pursuit of scholarship was very important um, uh, for, for us. And I think when my father dissuaded me f from not attending that shaka ever again, mm. uh, he was only making, you know, he didn't have the um, vision or intellect to understand the politics of it. Mm. But I think what he was simply doing is that, uh, you know, he had this very simple uh, structure in his mind of a human belief system and I think education formed a very important part of it and he thought that you know our only key to salvation the only way a we could be saved is if my son and my daughter they complete their education and stand on their own feet and we will be able to regain some of what we lost uh, in exile in Exodus in 1990. The last part, the part of this interaction I want to talk to you about the Indian state. Uh, in the page, in the very first chapter, in the uh, on page nine of your book, you say, "I no longer sing the national anthem." A few years ba uh, ago, a, be a child beggar at a traffic signal pinned the national flag onto my shirt. I threw it away in the west west bean of a cafe near my house. I think, I, was, I think I've, I think I've, I think I've really become angry about. Uh, the way the Indian state has treated us as a, as a community. Um, Is think, your anger just because the way you were sent out of the valley, or out of the valley because post the, that as because well? the, post that also because even now, after a, almost a quarter of a century of our exodus, hmm. the government has not been able to do anything for us. Most of us have moved on because of by the virtue of our education, etc. You know, people from my generation, they went to engineering colleges and medical colleges and IT uh, courses, and they were able to stand on their feet. But there are still so many people who are languishing in refugee camps, who are living on an abysmal government dole of 5,000 rupees per family. And if you look at some of the larger families, they are living on even uh, less than even the planning commission's ridiculous definition of below poverty line mm, they are going through a you know a lot of trauma pain and misery um, in 2008 under the prime minister's package um, 6000 jobs for kashmiri pandits were created back in valley out of here only about 1400 of them have been filled and i refer to them towards the end of my book um, how they are treated in Kashmir Valley still uh, by their erstwhile neighbors and colleagues etc the way they are discriminated against just because they are Kashmiri Pandits I think I think it's a biggest blot on 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 the on the face of uh, Indian Indian state but because secularism is not only about you should you know you should not look at secularism only from a Muslim prism you know the state has failed us it has failed to be secular because it has even failed to save the Kashmiri Pandits which are, a min which are a minority in, uh, in a state like Jammu and Kashmir. So they failed to protect uh, minorities not elsewhere also, not only elsewhere, but in Kashmir also. But do you think uh, if the first Kashmiri Prime Minister of this country and the most powerful Kashmiri Prime Minister of this country, funnily, both were Kashmiri Pandits, if they were alive, you would have seen the same problem? I don't think if uh, Nehru would have been alive, uh, or uh, Indra, I'm not sure of, but Nehru surely uh, he, he would not have allowed it. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I don't have the, I don't have enough scholarship to envisage uh, the vision of uh, Nehru. But I, I think in some ways I'm a uh, Nehruian by default, and I think uh, of his immense contrib contribution, which some of us uh, forget even now. I'm sure that even uh, if Mr. Nehru was here, uh, we would not have faced the kind of pain and misery, and you know, we would not have been in the same plight as we are but today. But what about Indra? Indra, throughout, she always said Indra had a uh, special place for Kashmir in her heart. She, she, she had, but uh, you, you know, uh, by the time she came to power, a lot of things had changed um, uh, in Kashmir, and you know, we always had that emotional connect uh, with with Nehru. 
uh, some of us had connection with Indira Gandhi also. But I think it was only because um, she was Mr. Nehru's daughter in, in many ways. So I'm not sure if Indira Gandhi would have been able to prevent it. Mm. Uh, but Nehru, Mr. Nehru, surely. Uh, at least I would like to believe that. Thanks a lot for speaking to us, Rahul. And uh, do read his book. It's really emotional. I was just telling Rahul before the interview that how first 21 minutes almost made me I mean, almost made me cry. I'm sure I don't know what's going to happen after I read the entire book. Thank you, Rahul. Thank you, Kunal.